be coming soon on your screen. We have a welcome question, the question of the day. So please use the chat box, which you can access on the bottom of your screen to tell us what new food item that you're excited about um, to maybe you're introducing it this summer um, in your summer meals program. So put that in the chat um, as long with introducing yourself, yourselves if you'd like. Um, we're just going to get started in a minute um, while we wait for folks to enter our virtual room. We'll get started in just a minute, um, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, please, if you can, put your name and organization um, and what new food item you're excited about to introduce in your summer meals program this summer. Love to hear it, Sherry, more fresh fruits and vegetables. That's always a win um, and perfect for summertime when you can get a lot of it. Ooh, authentic barbecue pork. Uh, that sounds delicious. I'll be right over, Craig. Great. Love to hear these fun ideas, bento boxes. Very cool. Um, keep continuing to put those in. Um, for the sake of time, we are going to um, go ahead and get started, but I will copy in. Uh, Hannah, actually, could you copy or write in the question into the chat um, so that folks can have that as a reference to keep putting in that um, their answers? All right, next slide. Okay, welcome everyone to Schools Out, Foods In, No Kid Hungry Summer Webinar Series. Today we are talking all things mobile meals. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Making It Mobile, a deep dive into mobile meal programs. Um, next slide. A few housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded um, and you will have access to the slide deck along with any links and the webinar recording um, after the webinar. It will be emailed out to you. Um, we also will have time for questions at the end of our presentation. So please, if you have those questions, uh, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box available at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to those at the end of the session. We have closed captioning available on this webinar, um, which you can access again on the bottom of your screen. And if you're having any technology or accessibility issues, please message the panelists Share Our Strength. That's my colleague, Hannah, and um, she'll be able to help um, with any of those, uh, help troubleshoot with any of those issues. We will continue to use the chat box. I'm loving to hear all the exciting new food items you're going to be using this summer. Um, and we'll use that throughout the presentation to engage with you all. So um, use it, um, comment, ask our panelists, or shout out any of, of when you see on this call too. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And again, questions can go in the Q&A box. At the end of today's webinar, a brief survey will pop up in your browser window. Uh, please take a moment to read that or to complete that. Uh, I read every single one of the responses and we take them very seriously because we want to make sure these webinars um, meet your needs and are um, what you want to be see, what you want to see from No Kid Hungry. Now for today's agenda. Next slide. After those brief uh, welcome introductions, um, we'll dive in with some mobile meals resources, um, and then I'll pass it over to our panelists. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Paige Bacorny. I am a senior program manager here at No Kid Hungry, focusing on summer and after school meals. And I use she, her pronouns, and I'm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Our wonderful panelists for today um, are Maggie Lynch from Metro West YMCA, Jamie Breidenbach from Missoula Food Bank and Community Center, and Mary Rose Monis from Shelby Public Schools. After you hear from them, we'll do that Q&A session. Next slide. If you are new to summer meals, uh, please, this link will be live when I send it out, check out our website. We have so many resources there, um, and you can always contact me if you're help, needing help navigating all of those resources. Next slide. I do wanna call out, 
for today's uh, topic, um, our mobile meals resources. So we have an entire section of our website dedicated to mobile meals, including, um, you know, launching a mobile meals program, making sure it's right for your community and all that good stuff. Next slide. And highlighting just some other resources, um, this uh, first one has been recently updated with the, the final rule that was issued this uh, past fall, um, but that is SFSP and SSO requirements. Um, this is a great resource um, that is a comparison chart of COVID era regulations and um, usual program regulations so that you can see those side by side of what will be changing this summer. Um, great for new staff or staff that started during pandemic operations um, to kind of as a reminder of those um, new uh, return to normal um, of the normal regulations. Also tips for congregate meal service, tips, uh, resources on staffing and area eligibility, a lot of great stuff. I will note um, that this presentation and today we're really going to be focusing on mobile meals, um, mostly in the congregate setting. Um, we do know um, USDA has um, uh, issued guidance on non-congregate meals in rural areas. Um, not all states have to opt into this. Um, so please, if you have questions, if you think it might be available in your communities, specifically, these are this is only available to rural communities, um, do reach out to your state agency um, to find out if it's an option in your state. Next slide. So this is the second in a fantastic series um, of summer webinars. Um, and I want to just remind you all of what's coming up. So next month, we'll be talking about all about outreach and promotion. In May, we'll be talking about improving the experience um, of summer meals for kids and families. And then in June, um, I wouldn't be working on summer and after school without this webinar. Um, you, tips for year round meals. So tips for transitioning your summer meals program to an after school meals program. All right. And with that, I will pass it over to Maggie um, for to get us to get us uh, started on um, a deep dive into mobile meal programs. Over to you, Maggie. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, my name is Maggie. I am the director of nutrition services at the Metro West YMCA. We're located in Framingham, Mass. There's a nice little picture of our Y there. Um, and on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about our service area. Oh, I think about what we're doing at the Y and we'll kind of get into our service area and what we um, we look like here. So um, our Y has participated in the CACFP program since 2015, um, which was a really great starting point for us um, and kind of helped us initiate into becoming um, a summer food service program sponsor. Um, so during the school year, we're sponsoring 14 different sites, a combination of at-risk after school, outside school hours, child care centers. Um, and then in the summer, we are mostly opening um, or operating um, as open sites, um, but we do also have some closed enroll sites that we're serving. So um, we have about 1,000 kids, up to two, um, 1,200 kids. And last year we did 49,000 meals and snacks, which for us was a lot. <laughs> Um, so in the next slide here, we can take a look at what our service area is. Um, so our YMCA um, serves a, a, a larger community. Um, so you can see all of our little towns there that we are serving. Um, Framingham is a city, um, but our surrounding area is all um, towns. So what we do to determine, okay, where are we going to be serving this summer? Um, because we are a city that has pockets of wealth, um, but also really pockets of extreme poverty, it's kind of hard um, for us because the whole area doesn't qualify. Um, so we use the USDA's mapper, um, census mapper, which you can see right here, I took a screenshot of our service area. Um, so what we did is target parks and community centers in these areas that are at the highest need. Um, so in our first year, we, you know, we picked a handful of parks. We found where the most kids were located, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and that's where we really focused our mobile route on. Um, I will say that this year we're super excited um, for the opportunity to serve more kids because our, um, our area has, based on the 50% list of schools, um, able to serve anyone. So we're able to do a little bit more this year. So I'll talk about our expansion that we're going to grow into this year, which I'm super excited for. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, Hannah. 
Um, for our mobile meal service, uh, we were super excited. We actually were able to purchase two vans um, with the help of a grant. Um, so one of our grants uh, purchased two refrigerated vans, which I think one's, one's missing from my slide here, but it was able to get wrapped. It says why on the fly. It's nice and colorful and beautiful. Um, and when we go to the different parks, people really know, okay, the why is here with activities and with meals. Um, we also had this van that was kind of hanging out at one of our outdoor centers not being used. So we took all of the seats out of it. Um, we secured in some under counter refrigeration. We recently were able to purchase plug in um, hot holders so that we can serve hot meals this summer for the first time ever. Um, and then above, we have extra storage so we can put our sports equipment, our crafts, things that we need for, um, you know, extra gloves. Um, you know, stuff to serve our meals, all of that wonderful equipment has really great storage in here. I'm hoping at some point to keep expanding this to get this van wrapped, but um, again, really excited to just have the opportunity to have these vehicles to do our meal service, right, and make it mobile. So that's what we're operating out of. Um, this is, I hope, not too confusing for everyone, but here's a little bit about what our day looks like um, at our YMCA. So we have a morning route that isn't necessarily a, a mobile route in the sense that we're going to parks, but we are um, dropping off meals at all of our partners. So if they're receiving more than 15 meals, it's easier for us to drop it off because we can, you know, um, make sense of that cost. So we're delivering to um, a YMCA in, outside of our service area, which is a really great um, partnership. So, you know, always looking to partner with other people that we can sponsor and, and help out if there's kids who need meals. Um, we go to a handful of community centers and are dropping off food there too. Um, so this is all taking place about 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning. We're dropping off um, lunch and then a cold breakfast for the next day. In the afternoon, um, last year you'll see we were going to um, two different parking lots. So we, we went to a park, Arlington Street Park. This is where our whole mobile unit started. Um, we found an incredible opportunity. There's tons of kids in this park, so much housing located around it. It's in that red zone on the um, USDA map, um, census mapper. Let's go there. Um, also around our YMCA, a similar situation. Um, so in the afternoons, it was just park in the parking lot, hand out meals, um, an easy target audience, right? Um, I mentioned expansion this year. So we feel so confident in our mobile route that we were able to set up last year that this year we're really expanding it. Um, and, and it's gonna be a wild year. So we're doing, um, you can see here in the afternoon, we'll go at 10.30 in the morning until um, 1.30 in the afternoon, pack up our van. Um, we get all of our coolers cleaned out from the morning. We put all of our meals inside of them and we're loading them up onto our refrigerated van. Um, we'll go to park number one which is our, our friends over at Arlington Street Park, drop off a staff member there. And then our van will go to site number two for an hour. So we'll be there um, serving at our second site from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, and this year we're really excited because in past years, which I'll talk about, um, we've partnered with our bookmobile once a week at Arlington Street Park. And um, through conversations and building relationships last summer, we're now going to be able to follow along the bookmobile route this year and every day of the week go to a different site. So that's already five new sites that we weren't hitting last year that we're going to be able to hit. So we are just so excited to be able to reach more kids. Um, and I mentioned we have two refrigerated vans and an activity bus. So that means we have that opportunity to have our second refrigerated van at another park that we identified, um, thanks to our friends at Par um, Parks and Rec, which again, I'll talk about. Um, but they are offering a summer camp that has a morning session and an afternoon session with this in-between time where nothing's really going on. So we thought, okay, that's a perfect opportunity for us to go in there and serve kids meals. So um, you'll see our second um, at Bowditch Field, we're there every day. That's a huge park in Framingham um, serving meals. And then again, that second opportunity um, that we're working on to go to our local beaches um, or lakes in the area um, with that new waiver that's coming through with us. So um, we're really excited for expansion. But just to show you, you know, we have that morning drop off and then the afternoon is really where that or later morning into the afternoon is where that mobile route really takes off. Um, and there's a way to, to, to work that into your schedule so you can be targeting more kids um, instead of like we were just staying in, in one park. Um, so partnerships and, um, and programs, we would be nothing without our partners. Um, 
that is really what helped us increase our numbers. Um, so we partnered with, you can see here on the left-hand side, all of our partners. I talked about our bookmobile. There's a beautiful picture of their, um, their unit there. Um, a place to turn is a local food pantry. So they would be in the parks every um, Wednesday, handing out household essentials like cleaning supplies. It was COVID tests, um, soap, deodorants, feminine products, um, and staple items for people's households. Um, so that was a, a day that we had really high attendance and we could serve as many as 50 plus meals. Um, Discovering Hidden Gems is a local group in Framingham. Um, they work to identify um, students who are living in at-risk neighborhoods and really help work with them to grow their full potential um, and opportunities. So these teens were running enrichment every day in the park, and then we would show up and support them with their activities, but also serve meals for the kids that were showing up. Um, so you can see the, the kids did an awesome um, food art. That was just one of the many very creative ideas. We had soccer nets. We have a very big Brazilian population who loves to play soccer. So we were like, okay, let's do it as much as we can. Um, the kids loved water play. Um, we talked to a neighbor who let us hook up to their hose, which is like unheard of um, so that the kids could have water play. They could water our gardens that we had raised beds for. Um, so you can see in the bottom corner here, we have some of our staff um, did a planting activity one day um, where families could come and plant a tomato plant or a pepper plant and they could take it home. We talked to them about, um, you know, you can do this on your fire escape and your window. So we did education too at the parks, which I think was a great way to bring more people in. Um, on Fridays, our YMCA through a separate grant was able to purchase food and do another food distribution on Friday to help families get through weekends, kind of supporting um, adults uh, in addition to the kids, since we know adults need to eat too. Um, and we saw, again, on Fridays, tons of people were coming, 50 plus. So um, a lot of what we did, we saw higher numbers on days that we had really great events, um, partners there. So again, just really trying to strengthen your partners as much as you can, because um, it makes a huge difference. Um, all right, so marketing. So without marketing and promotion, how do people know to get to our sites, right? So we had a really heavy emphasis on marketing. We purchased Facebook and online ads. We had everything in, in multiple languages. Um, we created door hangers, which our um, interns and our um, partners at Discovering Hidden Gems went to all of the houses in about one a one mile radius of the parks we were at and same with our YMCA and did the door hangers on people's um, doors, mailboxes to promote, hey, come to our park. We're gonna be right down the street from you. Um, our city has an incredible network of food providers who we all work together very closely. We have meetings on Mondays, we talk to each other, where are you, what are your service hours? And our city posts all of that for us on their website. Um, we had a huge kickoff event uh, where we were able to print out our summer menu. Also our um, enrichment calendar that Discovering Hidden Gems, Bookmobile, Place to Turn, all of those were on there. Um, so everybody was able to see what they what days they wanted to come for meals, for enrichment, and just knowing that, okay, we're in the park every day, come eat with us. Um, and again, relying on our partners who have the relationship with the people in the community to help us promote our, um, our summer eat sites was, was huge. So definitely rely on your partners again. <laughs> uh, the next slide here shows you just some of the meals we were doing for our mobile site. So again, last year, everything was cold. Um, we didn't have our, our hot holders. Um, we're so excited this year to be able to switch it up. Occasionally on Fridays, we would grill or do barbecue. Um, and again, on those days, we saw higher numbers. But our kids, we talk to them. What do you want to see? They love snack packs. Um, what kid doesn't, right? I love it as an adult. Um, loved our mac and cheese, our, our burrito bowls, our burgers. Um, so there's just a few ideas for anyone who's out there looking for some new ideas. Um, we would we did have waivers last year, right? So we could do non-congregate feeding. We could do multiple meals in one service time. Um, so we were able to bundle meals, which was super helpful. Um, but we still had a handful of people who stayed and ate with us in the park, um, which we're, we were excited for because this year that's going to be our new normal, right? Um, so knowing we have a little assurance knowing that our kids and our families like that anyways. Um, so we would set up a picnic table there. You can see Anthony serving some meals. We have a big pitcher full of ice cold water for the kids. We have a hand washing station as well for them. And then they can take um, their meal and go sit at a picnic table and, and they would all eat together, which was really cute to see. 
um, like a cafeteria in the park. Um, so that's a little bit about meal service. And then just these last two slides, I'm going to talk about some things to consider and things that can help you be successful in your mobile routes. Um, community need is huge for us. Um, I know that I am a white woman showing up in a neighborhood that I don't live in. Um, so I need to hear what my community wants, right? Um, how do I get staff that can talk to them? How do I get people that know the food that this community likes to eat? I'm not the expert in that. So I really rely on my community to help me with that. Um, we are really lucky that we have um, partners with Discovering Hidden Gems who could kind of be our bridge so that we could gain trust from our community. Um, so we weren't just showing up and taking over. That's not our goal, right? We want them to feel like they're seen and they're heard and we're providing them a service they want. Um, every third Sunday, our community has um, like a block event, if you will, where we provide resources. So leading up to the summer, we showed up and we did taste test activities. We also did surveys on what times our families wanted to eat at. We were surprised we actually wanted to eat later than we thought. And we would have totally missed a whole group of people if we didn't have that polling. So talk to your community and see what they want. Um, we, uh, weather again, right? Like it's the summer, there can be a storm that rushes right through and it, it can ruin your whole meal service. Um, or it can be extremely hot to the point where people don't wanna even come outside of their homes. So weather is something to consider, always be checking in on it and have a backup plan. Um, we actually were able to, through these block events, collect a lot of people's phone numbers, email addresses. Um, so we had a texting service that would go out. It only happened twice where there was like a hurricane coming through and we will not be there, but we'll see you tomorrow. Um, here are some other places that you can go for food if you really need it. Um, we do have tents that we put up above our meal service and also above where the kids eat um, because the heat can be um, you know, really extreme, especially if you are at a park with a blacktop. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and then social media, we had QR codes always with us um, that families could scan it and it had our menus in multiple languages, our enrichment calendars, but also if we were canceling service due to weather, we knew that our families would be able to find out really quick, um, which again, it didn't happen often, but you have to think about things like that just in case. Um, something else to consider is your staffing. Um, so how many people do you need? We're, and I hope everyone too, starting to hire for all of these positions because we know that when the time comes, you need to be ready. Um, we have trouble hiring drivers every year and with a mobile route, that's something you really need. Um, drivers are expensive, especially here in Massachusetts. So also again, another cost that you have to think about when going mobile. Um, but we also really rely heavily on volunteers to offset that. So um, I would say if you can utilize volunteers, they are so willing to help. They're passionate to get behind us for this project. So um, volunteers will actually meet our staff at the parks um, and help us support so that the other, um, so that we can head off to our second site this summer. So we already have people signing up to volunteer to serve with us this summer. Um, and we are super grateful for that because it makes a huge difference in offsetting costs. Um, my last bit here uh, is just how to have some success. Uh, like I said, check in with your participants. We survey frequently throughout the summer um, to make sure we're meeting all their needs. Maybe it's not even a food need, but it's a resource need that they might have. Um, are they liking our foods? Are we meeting their dietary requirements? Um, so just check in with them. Um, biggest thing is where do people congregate, right? You don't want to show up to a park and it's not where people are going. Um, so we talk to our community, to our politicians. We talk to, you know, the kids who are here in our YMCA, like, where do you guys go so that we can, um, you know, bring the food to you. And that's been really helpful. Um, be consistent, right? You're creating relationships. People rely on you for your food. Don't show up late. Um, you know, we had one time where our bus was late and we were like, we're so sorry. Our people were so devastated. Um, so just making sure you're always there. It never happened again, I promise. <laughs> um, and, and having the same faces there every week so that the kids, um, in the same day, if you can, because the kids really um, grow relationships with them. And last but not least, um, success doesn't happen if people don't know what you're doing. So share your story local media sources, Facebook, connecting with partners, um, have as many people as you can share your story because you're all doing incredible work. And by going into the communities um, where people are and meeting them where they're at, um, I think is a way to decrease a huge barrier um, for families who need food. So we're really proud of our success we've had with our mobile route. We started really small because we tried to, you know, if you start too big, it's very overwhelming. So last year we actually scaled back a little bit 
and had such great success, created such awesome partnerships that this year we're confident in our ability to um, to grow our program. So that is my my bit of advice is uh, start small, create relationships, and I think you'll have excellent success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. That was fantastic. I'm already booking you for next year's uh, Mobile Meals webinar because I need to hear about all the successes after this incredible expansion year. Uh, also, I'm going to pass it over to Jamie. And just a reminder, if you have questions for Maggie or any of our panelists, please do put those in the Q&A box. All right, Jamie. Thank you, Paige. Hi, I'm Jamie Breidenbach. I am the program manager for Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. Missoula is um, a one of the bigger cities in Montana, being a, a large state with small, small cities. Um, here's some demographic information um, regarding our town. Uh, Missoula Food Bank and Community Center serves the Missoula County, which is a large county. Um, it takes like an hour and a half to drive across the whole thing, um, which is like 90 miles. Um, so it's a big county. Next slide, please. We got our mobile meal bus, our Kids Eat Free bus, um, funded by a grant in 2018 um, by No Kid Hungry. Um, we purchased a handicap accessible bus out of Las Vegas and converted it into our, our mobile meal bus. Um, we added our refrigerators, we switched around some seats and added tables, we put in shelves and countertops, we uh, put in external speakers. So think like your ice cream bus, only we had a local kids band write a song. Um, so we blast our kids eat free bus song as we drive through neighborhoods. Next slide, please. This is what the inside of our bus looks like. So as you can see in one picture, um, it's those chairs that have been converted around. Um, Pre-pandemic, a lot of kids were eating on the bus, and so um, we had a couple tables for kids to eat on, um, and then we had this countertop where we had sort of this buffet style set up, um, and kids could get their food items and put it into a bag. Next slide. Uh, we have found that we have more success going to high density housing areas. Um, we we have tried offering meals at some parks, but did not have the turnout that we were expecting. Um, so we have been visiting and stuck with um, two low income apartment complexes around town, as well as two mobile home parks. We choose our locations um, based on income of the area, um, eligibility um, for reimbursement is definitely a factor, and we use the um, the area eligibility map. We also use data from schools regarding the 50% free and reduced meal numbers. Um, but our sites are low income housing areas. Um, we also take in consideration our proximity to other open meal sites. So whether that's a site that we sponsor or um, one that the school district sponsors. Um, we take in consideration the walkability or bikeability from um, to one of those open meal sites or if um, the city bus line is uh, close to that location. So a few of our spots, um, there's no city bus that goes to them. And so access to meals or groceries is challenging um, and they are far from a, another meal site. So walkability or bikeability is, is minimal. Um, next site, please. Here is, um, a Google Maps screenshot of um, our town and where our bus goes. So in the center of that map is Missoula Food Bank. Um, that's where our bus stop starts. Our first site is on the south side of town um, at an apartment complex that is not on the bus line. Our second site is again an apartment complex that's family housing um, associated with our university district. Um, the third and fourth sites are mobile home parks um, that have green spaces in them that we park at. Um, 
The fourth site there is um, out of town and again, not on a bus line. This is our uh, summer meal magnets that we get made every year. We have several different magnets. Um, this one is for our bus. We also have one that has all of the open meal sites in Missoula. Um, we serve a few um, communities that are outside of Missoula City, but still in Missoula County, and they get a magnet specific to those locations. Um, these get handed out through Missoula Food Bank's um, pantry um, on the month leading up to summer. We also distribute these magnets through our um, backpack meal program, which is our, we call them power packs. Um, so we are providing in power packs to all of the schools in Missoula County and the, the counselors at each school that hand those packs out receive a magnet for every child, as well as an electronic version of this magnet to put into their newsletters. Next slide, please. Again, here is um, a map of Missoula City. Um, so we're just we're just seeing our, our city open meal sites. Right? This doesn't have the outlying county open meal sites. Um, the green little circles are Missoula Food Bank um, sites. One is at the Missoula Public Library, the other being at Missoula Food Bank and Community Center itself. The bus or what we saw from the last side um, are open meal sites that our mobile bus goes to. Um, the apples are the open meal sites that the school district runs. And then the little blue truck is open meal sites that uh, a local church runs. Next slide. Um, this is data from 2022. So um, Missoula Food Bank, in addition to our mobile meal sites partners with organizations like Boys and Girls Club, like um, Parks and Rec to offer summer meals. Um, we have partners in other schools, again, in the county that we are serving open meal sites. So all those combined, we have 34 different sites and partners, and we served thousands of meals, over 80,000 meals in the summer of 2022. Next slide, please. Um, the, the, the human power it takes to, um, to make all these meals and hand them out is, is large. Um, the bulk of our work is done by volunteers. We have a very robust volunteer program. Um, so every day we have one to three volunteer shifts, um, and those are 10 plus people that come and volunteer for two hours at a time to um, make our sandwiches, wash and bag um, the produce, or package up our meals into, into sacks. In the summer, we hire um, hopefully five, um, what we refer to as summer staff, but they're a combination of AmeriCorps Summer Vistas and a No Kid Hungry Youth Ambassador. And so those folks are the folks that are um, at our sites handing out meals. Um, they have a deeper understanding of the program, um, all the rules and logistics. And so there are our site supervisors. And then we have um, really three paid staff that are dedicated to this program in the summer. Um, next slide, please. Here are some of our volunteers preparing our sandwiches in the commercial kitchen that we have on site. Next slide. Once all the food is prepared, it then goes into these assembly lines where we have volunteers pack it. Um, we designate breakfast into a produce bag and lunch and supper into brown paper bags. So that way it's easy to distinguish between the two meals. Um, these bags are then packaged into banana boxes, um, depending on the number of meals needed at each location. Um, and then they are stored into our refrigerator on green racks. Um, next slide, please. Um, the bus in 2022 served almost 5,000 meals. And here's some, some pictures um, of, of our bus serving meals at a couple of our different locations. Um, next slide, please. So all of our menus, all of our meals are cold prep, cold serve. 
and all of our menu items are kid tested and kid approved. Um, we're always looking for new ideas. So I really appreciated Paige's question at the beginning of this webinar um, and I was jotting down some ideas for, um, for new foods to offer. Next slide, please. Um, every menu, we have a fresh produce item, and we, we pair that depending on um, the requirements of the meal um, with a shelf-stable fruit or vegetable item, so that helps to reduce the, the number of hours needed to prepare our, our, each meal. Um, all meals are served with 1% white milk. We don't do any flavored milk, and all of our grains are whole grains. Next slide, please. Um, here is an example of a week's worth of um, breakfast items. Again, like I was telling you, I think it's challenging to find cold prep, cold serve food. So I um, wanted to share some of the things that we do. We do offer a protein um, most days for our breakfast item. Because we have the benefit of having so many volunteers, most of our reimbursement dollars can go into food purchasing rather than paying staff. Um, which allows us the opportunity to, to offer protein in breakfast every day. Next slide, please. Here is an example of a lunch menu. Um, we do try to offer an additional um, item. Um, again, because we have volunteers doing all of our work, we can afford to do so. So in addition to what is required, there is an extra item every day to make our meals a little more robust. Um, next slide, please. And here is an example of our supper menu. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Missoula Food Bank does find additional funding to provide all adults with meals at each of our location. We feel like that is a very important thing to do because um, we know we are better parents when we're not hangry. Um, it also allows adults to role model healthy eating for, for their children. Um, any leftover meals that we have, we either save and serve the following day. If we can't do that, we disassemble the meals um, and reuse what we can, for example, milk. It hasn't been opened, it's not expired, we can reuse that and put that into another meal. Um, or we provide um, food to the Pavarello, which is our local um, shelter and kitchen for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and they use those as grab and go meals for, for their customers. Um, we also, because we are a food bank, we can put our extra, uh, some food that can't be reused in our um, menus into our pantry and people shopping in our store can access that food as well. Um, next slide. So Missoula Food Bank um, does have the benefits of having lots of different things going on. Um, and so we are able to, within our organization, partner with other um, services to offer additional um, support to our families who come to our mobile meal sites. Um, next slide, please. So one day at each of our four locations, we offer grab and go groceries. Um, so we just pack up um, a bag of perishable and a bag of non-perishable foods and hand this out to, to families. Um, we do have families that only access our, our grocery delivery program and don't have children who come and get meals. So um, like I was saying, some of our sites are not close to a bus line, so it is challenging for um, some folks to get into the food pantry. And this allows just that the access to groceries. Um, for those families. Next slide. Um, every Friday, we hand out an Empower Pack. So again, that is our weekend backpack meals. Um, so Friday, we don't do groceries. We just do Empower Packs, and that allows... Um, we are just a Monday through Friday um, mobile meal bus, and so this bridges that gap for when we show back up on Monday. Next slide. We um, get partner with United Way and in August are able to hand out backpacks um, that are age appropriate. So um, United Way puts school supplies into these backpacks and there's an elementary, middle and, and high school pack. And so we are able to hand those out as well. Um, next slide. A few of our community partners, um, we have an organization called Families First that offers a reading and eating program. 
So they come to a couple of our sites for an hour. They show up when we show up with meals um, and then kids stay and they will have a famous community member. So think like a university basketball or football player or a firefighter or a police officer who is the um, guest reader for the day. And then kids can take books home with them from that program. We've also had kids who then donate books back, which is very sweet um, for other kids to, to benefit from. Uh, Parks and Rec will be coming this coming summer um, to offer an hour of physical activity each day. Um, our bus always has a resource referral guide on it. Um, in addition to food, uh, families have um, other financial strains. And so we have um, resource guides that provide, um, you know, low cost summer camp child care, medical support, housing support, you know, other food support, um, depending on, on the need of the family. Um, in a COVID benefit where we were putting together activity kits. And so we have some community partners who put together kind of a grab and go activity kit that kids can take home with them. Think like a little art project or a maze or you know something that they're doing. Um, if they bring back the completed activity kit, we have little prizes, um, play though, little you know toys, packs of gum, something like that to hand out to those kids. Um, at the end of the summer, or I guess in August, um, we've done a, a ice cream bus. So it's a local, it's the Big Dipper um, ice cream um, store has followed the mobile meal bus around and provided free ice cream to the kids who come to, to get lunch. Um, and then we have done free haircuts for one of our higher needs neighborhoods, kind of a part of a back to school bash that we did. Okay, thank you so much um, for having me and looking forward to any questions or more suggestions for cold serve, cold prep meals. Thank you, Jamie. That was fantastic. I love how holistically you serve your community and families. Um, I always love to hear you speak. Um, okay, to round us out, we have Mary Rose from Shelby Public Schools. Hi, my name is Mary Rose Vanis, and I have been working in food service for about 36 years now. If you can tell my, by my accent, it's not traditionally from Shelby, Michigan. It, it's to Irish, so I based our, some of my knowledge is from feeding kids in, America, in Ireland as well as the United States. What we find in Shelby Public Schools is that we're a rural area. Um, the, our percentage of ch children who are on the free and reduced list without having to do any income-based searching is 85%. So you can imagine that during the summer when they're off school, uh, it's, it becomes a burden for some of our families to feed their kids. Shelby Public Schools is uh, in Oceana County in Michigan, which is just right about on the lake. And it's a very touristy area during the summer. Uh, next slide, please. So what we want to, to work for our families is that, do we need a congregate seating, feeding site? So our, our, our area, with some of our children live 15 miles away from the school. So we would absolutely need to go to that area every day if we're doing congregate feeding. In the past, we have gone to sites which are in our little town. In our little town, I'm talking two or 3,000 people. Um, but when we move out of the town, we have pockets of students who are basically on their own to take care of themselves. And unless we can get to near where they are, their parents won't let them leave the house unsupervised. So uh, we need to get the access to those students. So we go out to some of our migrant sites. Um, we have a countryside site 
in a, a local town called Ferry. And that's where we would find most of our at-risk kids who, this is us in the middle of winter, by the way, during COVID, trying to keep warm as we went out to, to ferry to feed our families. And I will say that during COVID, Shelby Public Schools became a hub, um, not officially, but it became a necessity uh, because our, our, our drop off uh, catchment for vendors, they didn't want to come and go to 25 different little drop offs and give food to maybe facilitate meals for 50 people. So what we did with the assistance of No Kid Hungry was we got a grant for a forklift truck and we got a grant to buy a shelter to stand under so we wouldn't get hypothermia or sunstroke. And then we also got a grant for a uh, box van. Next slide, please. So this is our forklift truck. The, what, what happens with us is that the vendors didn't want, don't necessarily want to come to us um, because we have um, so many small drop-offs. So we became a hub where three 50-foot um, container lorries come and drop the food off us, for us. Now I'm using words which are Irish because I'm nervous. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 for us, what we did was we, we said to the vendor, please come to Shelby Public Schools. I, I talked with our administrators and the superintendent was very supportive in having the two trucks dropped off and we then dispersed to the community. So we had faith-based organizations, we had other school districts, we had uh, local, local community food pantries because nobody wanted to come to us. So we're going to incorporate part of that this summer into our program and develop uh, permanent relationships, hopefully with some of the organizations that came and got food because we can do the reimbursable meal and we can have them facilitated at their site, but what they needed was the food and the equipment and the help to be able to uh, have all the resources they needed. I hope you can notice there that this young, young lady, actually she's a grandmother, she came and she collected her food with her tractor. We are very resourceful in Michigan. Next slide, please. So they, this young family here, they were just so delighted. But, uh, the food that the kids get, what we try to do is we try to make it as familiar to the students as possible. We try and make it uh, like the food they would receive in school. We would, we spend our funding on staffing and local uh, farm foods and meals, which we cook rather than using processed foods. But we're at a big advantage in that we have uh, commercial kitchens to cook in and lots of staff who are quite happy to work during the summer. We maybe get a couple of weeks off here and there, but. They, they want to continue to have a salary. Um, so, and we also part, partner very closely with United Way and the Feeding America. And that is where we use most of our volunteers. I, last time we had a truck where our, our superintendent and his family, they came and they helped give out the food. It's wonderful to see all the volunteers that come. Next slide, please. These are some of our volunteers and our paid staff. This is actually a faith-based organization, Salvation Army, come to take the food to where they would be able to disperse it in their area. Um, 
we reached out to the local community partners. This is a, a local community centre, the ladder. Some of these volunteers are based in the ladder. And that way we can have more sites. Like we might only be one big site with maybe six smaller sites ourselves. But if we can squirrel in other sites to come and get the food and give them the training that they need to be part of the Summer Food Service Programme, we, we will do that. It's it's hard to, in, in the community where we are, to have rural distribution in all areas. For example, if you're in Detroit, you might have $5,000 and hit 5,000 kids. In Shelby, Michigan, you're gonna have, if you have $5,000, you might only hit 500 kids. So it's, uh, on a wing and a prayer, we reach out to, for grants and hope that we can facilitate the transportation of the meals because really we want to keep a high quality product for the kids to eat. Next slide, please. This is wonderful. The, these are some of our teachers who actually go out to our uh, community and our migrant, we have a large migrant population. I would say about 55% of our district is our Hispanic Latino. And um, what this lady here is very familiar with all the families. So they were comfortable with her coming to their house. Um, we have many volunteers who, who love to go out into the community. The fallback there is I would like to hire them, but they don't want to be hired. They want to go do, do the job when they want to do the job. What we have also come across is that sometimes we have um, sites where the weather is so extreme, like if it's not snow, like this is spring break week and we've got snow. In the summer, we get extreme heat. However, Michigan Department of Education allow you to let them go home with the meals if it's extreme heat, you know, if there's an extreme weather warning. Or we try and get meals inside a building then, like the community centre you would have seen in Ferry earlier. Next slide, please. So this is, these are the kind of projects we do with our students in order to keep them involved and to make them uh, feel part of the program. And the, we've had students who made cherry pies because we grow the cherries. We, we've got to let our students know how to make the food with the cherries. And we had a cooking with teens program, which involved the teens, as you see here, Andrew, he's actually one of our staff now. He, uh, we taught them how to make certain foods. And then at the end of the program, their parents came and they cooked a meal on site for their parents. And they were able to then go home with the equipment and the food to make some of the meals. So we also, work with uh, one of our uh, Keep Fit uh, organizations in a local town and supplied meals there while the kids were being part of the program. Next slide, please. Well, how many sites we can serve is about six ourselves, but there isn't anything to stop you uh, training other sites like of the district or the neighborhood adjacent to you isn't taking part in any of the programs, then you can approach that district and ask them if they would mind you reaching out to faith-based organizations or to uh, community groups if you can go on to their turf. I wouldn't ever go into a neighboring district without permission from the district. Um, that way we were able to feed more kids because they couldn't travel. Our issue is traveling 12 miles there, 12 miles back for breakfast and lunch is kind of 
the kids would suffer. We have had many feedbacks from our local uh, health department who work with some of our at-risk kids saying that they have visited homes where the children are just looking out the window waiting for us to arrive because they know that the school bus is going to be there at 10 o'clock. Although it's it's wonderful, it's sad too, but we need to recognize that what we're doing here is we're feeding children. We're not, um, we, we don't want to put obstacles in their way. We want to, to celebrate uh, each child and hope that we can take care of them. Um, this little girl here, her name is Mercy. And this is, this is grapes. We give her grapes and you would have thought we'd give her candy. And she's one of eight children. And we actually did a competition with our parents because we're in a growing area. We have lots of farmers offering us produce at very good prices. So we uh, give it to our parents. And these are some of the, this is an example of what the parents um, uh, invite or entered into the competition. But it was the fact they involved, you know, this, this mother obviously took a lot of time to make this, what does it look like, a lion? Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you could understand everything I said. We could understand every word. Thank you so much, Mary Rose. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. Um, Please do continue to put those questions in the Q&A box. And if we don't get to them, we'll answer them um, at our best via email. Um, but one uh, kind of reoccurring theme I noticed in some of the questions, and I'll send it to Maggie first because she addressed it a little bit already. Um, but how do you ensure children stay on site um, when you are in areas that cannot offer non-congregate meals? Yeah, great question. So we... Um... We try to set that expectation like right from the start, right? So we have our staff sitting at picnic tables. We also bring some yoga mats that kids can sit on if they prefer. Um, and our staff is sitting with them. Volunteers are sitting with them, um, just making sure everybody knows, okay, take your meal and let's come sit over here. Let's talk. Um, we do try to put like incentives on the table to get people to make sure that they do sit down. Um, so we have coloring pages. Um, you know, we have different fidgets and, and such that kids can play with. Um, and then we do have like a box of prizes too. So if kids are sitting down and maybe there's somebody new or a returning person that's come every day of the week, we'll make sure they get a little incentive as well. That's great. Um, from the other speakers, any other thoughts on keeping kids on site uh, to eat their meals? I think one thing I forgot to mention too, sorry guys, is we work with Parks and Rec to get picnic tables. So um, I think someone had asked a question and I said, you could talk to the housing authorities too, to see if they'll partner with you and make sure you have the stuff you need for kids to sit at. So now I'll pass it on. <laughs> we, we actually got a $7,000 grant from the Department of Education to have a nutrition teaching program this summer. We're, and we're going to partner with one of our teachers who is going to go out to the sites and have a fun time with the students whilst they're learning and eating. So, and there's quite a lot of money out there if you're rural at the, also um, because of the, the obvious added cost of going out to rural, rural settings. I would just echo what Maggie said of, of the partners and the activities. Kids come for the food, they stay for the activity, um, and then as well as places to eat and making it a welcoming environment. Great. Um, one last question, a little uh, wonky, not wonky, we all need them. Um, do you all receive funding through, um, I think it's SFSP, so are all these uh, summer food service program programs, um, and then um, what POS systems do you use, so point of service? So we use a point of service called Meal Magic, um, and we also have on-site congregate programs as well during the summer, so it comes in handy more for that. 
and Michigan Department of Education have a, have a resource for online um, they, where you can just input each child and they will calculate all your meals for you. And uh, what was the other part of it? The point of service I got, what was the other part? Um, are, are these funded through the summer food service program or, yes. or seamless summer option if you are a school? Yes, and, and also some grant funding so that we can work with local farmers to bring in the fresh fruit, vegetables and products that they have available. That's great. Thanks, Mary Rose. Maggie, Jamie, real, real quick. We, we use a paper system. So we, our state provides us with the tally. We just cross them off. And then at the end of the day, they come back. We put it into an Excel sheet just so we can um, just keep an easier track of uh, our math at the end of the month. Yeah, we are also a SFSP site, um, and we, depending on the spot, we either use a paper version or we do use the online app um, through the SFSP program. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I know we're a little bit over, so I'm trying to be respectful of other of all of our attendees. So next slide. Um, we do want you to stay in touch, sign up for our newsletter, um, and visit our website. Next slide. And then um, if you just take one moment, uh, that's all we ask, complete that short survey that'll pop up and pop up on your browser. Um, then next slide. I think that's it from us. There, here's my contact information. I just want to thank uh, our speakers so much. Uh, Maggie, Jamie, Mary Rose, um, you were all so fantastic. I learned so much. Um, so really, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, um, everyone joining us today for your time to sit with us for an hour um, and learn a bit more about mobile meals. Um, if you have any questions, never hesitate to reach out. My contact information is there on the slide, ppcorney at strength.org. Um, and we'll see you next month, um, the end of April, uh, for a webinar all about um, outreach and promotion. So lots of marketing strategies and all that good stuff. So see you then. And I hope everyone has a great day.